no need of tilling your land. And in fact, when you're tilling, or when you're not practicing conservation agriculture, you realize you're spending, spending, and spending. Like everything is, is a plus in your production. But when you're practicing conservation agriculture, it's minus. David Naftali, a part of OusQuest team. Uh, OusQuest farm was established in 2012. And from 2012, we've been uh, growing different crops. And uh, the reason for establishing this farm was to show farmers that it's really possible to farm in arid or even semi-arid areas. Uh, this area receives an average annual rainfall of about uh, 500 millimeters per annum. And uh, with that rainfall, compared to Mount Kenya and the Rift Valley, this area receives uh, very little rainfall within a very short period of time, which is in the long rains between March and June. And you find that you really need a crop that will be able to mature within that very short period. So when you are farming, we look at those crops that will, um, that will take a very short period to mature and also, also be uh, uh, like um, the rainfall that we have will be able to sustain that crop to maturity. Given that we are, we are in an arid area, we use uh, conservation agriculture as our principle of farming. And in conservation agriculture, you will realize we don't till our land, we control weeds, we have a controlled traffic, like all our machines will always be using uh, one way and uh, we maintain our soil cover. Through those principles, you will realize that we don't lose much moisture, so we conserve our moisture in the soil. Um, it's the same way you can turn it upside down. When you go to places where you get so much rainfall, people will store water in dams, but for us we are storing our waters underground, so it's just uh, so long as you preserve your water, it doesn't matter whether it's above the surface or below the surface. So ours is below the surface, and that's why we don't want to till our land. When you till your land, you turn the soil, and when you turn, you expose your moisture to the sun. And that means you're going to lose up to 30% of your soil moisture to vaporization. Secondly, we make sure we don't have any weed. Like we control up to 95% of weeds in, uh, in the field. And we do that by uh, using herbicides or even hand picking. Like when we have a crop in the field, we don't go in with herbicide, we just put people in and uh, hand pick the weeds. Uh, weeds are the greatest robbers of moisture. If you want to lose uh, much moisture in your farm, just let weeds grow there. So you realize even when we don't have any crop in our field, our fields are clean because we don't want to lose that moisture. Um, on soil cover, whenever we harvest, we don't feed um, our residue to animals, we feed our soil. So we let that residue remain in uh, the soil and it will act as soil cover. When you have that soil cover, it's also have an advantage of being humus to the soil. That means you keep your soil healthy and it will keep producing more and more year in and year out. Another principle is uh, crop rotation. So you don't just grow legumes or pulses every year. You'll realize now we have beans, but in the beans you can see wheat residue. That means uh, we had wheat last season, and this season we have beans, and that's a complete uh, crop rotation cycle. So when we harvest our beans, we are going to have something like wheat, or barley, or even sorghum in uh, the places where we have either beans or green grams. And that's why when you are doing crop rotation, uh, there is a symbiotic relationship between the legumes and the grasses. Like the legumes will be fixing nitrogen in the soil and the grasses will come and uh, utilize that nitrogen and it will boost your production. When you are talking of uh, controlled traffic, when you look at, at uh, or when you look at the field, you can see we have wheel tracks every three meters. So every three meters you find wheel tracks. Why is it that way? Because uh, that's our principle. We're either on three, nine, or 27 meters. 
Our tractors are on three meters wheel. Our planter is on nine meters. So those are three sets of the wheels. And our sprayer is on 27 meters. So every time you are spraying, you are spraying 27 meters. So when you are controlling traffic, you reduce soil compaction. You are not compacting your soil. So only your farm roads or in roads will be compacted, but your seed beds, um, the soil is very loose. It's not compacted. And that's why this land was still like seven, eight years ago. We don't till our land. In fact, we call um, the jembes and the harrows, those are devil's tools. Because at creation, God never created the tractors, but he told Adam and Eve, go till the land. How were they tilling? Maybe they were just growing their crops, and at the end of the day, they were harvesting. It's interesting, because if you compare even in the savanna across the fields, that grass is growing very well, and you can see animals feeding on it. But ask yourself, who is tilling, um, who is tilling on that grass? or who is applying fertilizer on that grass, or who is weeding on that grass. So it happens naturally. And as you will see, in this soil, it's cracking. When you see that soil cracking, it's just telling you that it has run short of moisture. And when it rains, you will realize that all that soil will come together and it will be compacted. So there's no need of tilling your land. And in fact, when you're tilling, or when you're not practicing conservation agriculture, you realize you're spending, spending, and spending, like everything is, is a plus in your production. But when you're practicing conservation agriculture, it's minus, because first, you're not plowing your land. That means uh, the plowing labor is out, or if you have your own plow, your fuel labor is out, and you're, maybe the, if you're employing someone to do the plowing, that labor is out. Secondly, when... Um, you're controlling weeds, you realize when your crop is up, like in this field, you can see we have like weeds, 0.01% of weeds. If you had weeds in here and you have your crop, your cost of production will be very much high. But by controlling weed before even you plant, it means you're going to control weeds by far, or, or even uh, control your cost of uh, production by far. And more so in farming, what you want to look at is the profits. We don't want to make losses when you're farming. One of the good things uh, at Housequest is uh, mechanization. And mechanization makes everything very easy or the farm operations very easy and effective or efficient you'll realize uh, in any large-scale farming if you want to succeed you'll have to systemize like the greater percentage of your work you can system um, mechanize like 90 percent and then you systemize the 10 percent that means all the 90 percent will be done by the machine but you'll have a few people to be doing the 10% and that will also reduce your cost of production. Though we are practicing um, a mechanization, we are also involving the community in working for us. Like when you are windrowing the beans, we use um, human labor. They will come uproot the beans, put them in windrows, then uh, we thresh the beans using a machine. It's uh, good compared to having a combine. When you have a combine harvester, you'll realize you don't offer employment to the community. You're only offering employment to one person who is driving that combine or who is operating the combine. So this is uh, something we call a hybrid system. We want to move away from uh, combinable crops and start doing crops that can be harvested by both uh, human labor and machines. And that will help improve uh, the, the economics of this area. Another thing that we do is uh, sharing knowledge for free. When you want to come and learn at Housequest, we don't charge. You just book an appointment and when you come, you learn whatever you want and uh, we don't charge even a shilling for that. And we like that because uh, when we share, is there is a great likelihood 
of um, helping us not repeat maybe one mistake that we did previously. You will tell us when you do this, this will happen. And so we know that's not the right way to go. This is the way to go. When you're farming, um, you'll always encounter challenges. I'll tell you, some time back we had um, about 300 hectares of sorghum and it was all eaten by the birds. That's one of the challenges and I can tell you, we, some of the crops that we are not going to grow are bad crops. We call them bad crops because they'll always be destroyed by birds. So the greatest challenge um, we've had previously is uh, the birds. And at times we receive um, too much rainfall, which is uh, unpredictable, and we realize you lose some hectares. It's good because if, if it was small scale farming, you can go in and uh, replant the patches that were washed away by the rains. But in large scale, since you are using the machines, you can't get in and uh, do gapping in the areas that are washed away by the rains. There are also some years when you don't receive the amount of rainfall that you expected. And uh, that also led to reduction of yields because uh, maybe the germination percentage, or when you check at your crop per square meter, you don't meet your expectations. Another challenge we can say is um, VAT. As you can see like recently, uh, VAT was imposed on almost all agricultural inputs. Like now when you want to buy a and equipment, it's going to be vertible. Diesel is vertible. Farm chemicals are vertible. We are making silage and the silage wraps are vertible. So when the VAT is high and you are farming, we are selling nothing uh, at VAT. That means we can't recover your VAT cost, you can't balance it. So in farming, when you have a VAT on everything, it means your cost of production is high, and that is again passed to the consumers, which makes uh, the cost of uh, food very much expensive. So if we can get away that uh, agricultural inputs are not uh, vertical, that will really be beneficial to both uh, small scale and large scale farmers.